hello everybody and welcome to Drydock episode 149. This week the questions are taken from guide 207, that's on the Abdeel class fast mine layers, as well as the Wednesday video on naval logistics. So let us begin. Bucht91U asks, one always hears about the advantages of the N3 or G3 designs, but what would some of the shortcomings or disadvantages of those designs be? So there would have been some disadvantages just inherent to their time period if you're talking about them being used in later periods like with the Second World War. Torpedo protection probably would have been somewhat below what was possible or what was installed on treaty battleships, anti-aircraft firepower similarly. But the two biggest drawbacks of the N3-G3 style would have been one there is no rear arc uh, for coverage for the main gun turrets. Now that's a relatively minor one. Um, if you've heard an episode where I talked about the Richelieu class, for example, they have the same issue. It's not a huge one, to be perfectly honest. The circumstances where you're having to run, you can always just angle yourself slightly. But it, it is a, pro a potential problem if somebody is on your tail and you can't turn quickly enough for whatever reason. The other disadvantage, if you want to look at it in that way, is because all the machinery spaces are all aft, it means that potentially any hit from a torpedo or other similar underwater projectile um, aft of the third turret could potentially have catastrophic effects on your entire ability to manoeuvre. Uh, or to move at all, to be perfectly honest, because everything is is concentrated there. Now, you can make that argument of, well, if you've got all your machinery amidships, then uh, then a midships hit might do that. Well, yes, that's true, but that loops back to the what I was talking about with torpedo defences. Amidships is generally the broadest beamed part of the ship. Torpedo defences narrow by necessity as the ship's hull gets narrower, and whilst the G3 and N3 designs like the Nelsons had a somewhat fuller stern than was perhaps traditional, the hulls still did narrow, so there would have been slightly less torpedo protection for the machinery, which could have been a problem if they'd been hit aft by torpedoes that were powerful enough to overwhelm said defences. And although it wouldn't have been apparent at the time, one other potential issue with this kind of layout would have been anti-aircraft defence in the Second World War. Now, granted, you've got the entire stern area completely clear and free to stick as many AA guns as you like on with minimal to no risk of blast damage from the main battery because no fire aft fire arc. So you could have put a really hilariously strong anti-aircraft battery astern. The problem is that aircraft aren't usually so obliging as to only attack from your stern arcs and most of your broadside arc. They do tend to also attack from the front arc and the more forward aspects of your broadside arc. Now, you could then potentially, if you're doing a, a modernization or refit in the 30s, take out the twin sixes that were either side of the forward superstructure and replace them with something like twin 4.5s, probably be the best bet. But there's limited space there, and the rest of the armament is obviously weighted quite heavily for the main guns. So there's not going to be all that much space forward or forward broadside to mount anti-aircraft guns. So you're going to be restricted to what you can put on the superstructure, so maybe up to 20 mil, and maybe a few on the turret tops. Uh, that did happen. And I think with that little amidship space, you're going to have to make a fairly difficult choice between something like twin 4.5s and nests of 20 mil or 40 mil. Maybe you do some kind of hybrid where you only have one or two mountings of 4.5 and some pom-poms or something, but it would be a very difficult choice to make. So going into World War II, they, there may be some issues there with the forward arc coverage for anti-aircraft firepower. There, there are ways you could mitigate that, but it would be a weakness. Cal Taran asks... What is the criteria that defines a dual-purpose gun? And wouldn't most of those mean that Yamato has the largest dual-purpose guns by far? There are a lot of factors that 
go into defining a dual purpose gun. The first of which is high-ish, at least, elevation, i.e. an elevation probably at least minimum 40, 45 degrees, ideally a lot higher. Um, 40 to 45 degrees means that against torpedo bombers and stuff you'll be fine, but against dive bombers or level bombers you can defend ships that you're escorting or that are escorting you, but you can't defend yourself. So there is a limitation there. Whereas if you get up to sort of 60, 70, 80 degrees of elevation, then you can defend yourself against pretty much anything, which is somewhat better. But on top of that, you've got to be able to track aircraft. Now, tracking a ship that's moving at maybe at maximum 35-ish knots or thereabouts is one thing. Tracking an aircraft that's moving at 300 knots or more is quite another. So your ability to track the aircraft and the speed of your tracking motors in the turrets is going to have to be considerably more than if you were just engaging a regular ship. Now, fair enough, the aircraft might be far away or they might be coming in basically at you so that the angle of deflection isn't changing quite as much as that speed might suggest, but you've still got to be faster. And likewise with elevation, you've got to elevate your guns quickly enough to follow their movement. You've also got to have anti-aircraft fire control because anti-aircraft fire control is a somewhat different beast to surface fire control. So you're going to have to have an anti-aircraft fire control director linked up to your guns, ideally, unless it's really 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 close but when we talk about dual purpose we're talking about something that's going to be used against ships as well so probably four inch and up at which point you are going to almost certainly want um, an anti-aircraft fire control director rate of fire is another thing because you're almost certainly not going to hit your target first time so you're going to want to put quite a few shells in the air and again aircraft move considerably faster than ships so having a rate of fire that's relatively low isn't going to do all that much good unless you can absolutely blanket huge sections of the sky with shrapnel and finally the ammunition you're going to be using is it actually effective? There is the fairly standard shrapnel shell, and obviously a much larger sh shell due to the square cube law will be able to blanket the sky with a huge, huge amount of shrapnel. But the sky is also very, very big, which is why you need a, quite a number of shells, unless your targets are obligingly all coming in a nice straight line and don't really change course or speed all that much. Having VT fuses obviously helps, well that's more of a mid-World War II invention, and the larger the shell, the better they're capable of taking those kinds of fuses. So there is a certain advantage to the bigger dual-purpose guns. So when you combine all of those together, you'll see that there's actually quite a lot of different dual-purpose guns. There's quite a lot of dual-purpose 6-inch, and as has been in the background here, dual-purpose 8-inch on the county-class cruisers, and as Cal has mentioned, theoretically the 18.1-inch on the Yamato as well were capable of dual-purpose use because... They were all designed to be able to be used against aircraft. However, when you look at all of those factors together to see whether it's actually an effective dual-purpose weapon, i.e. does it actually stand any kind of reasonable chance of providing a meaningful level of defence against aircraft, that eliminates from the list quite a lot of the larger guns that might other you might otherwise stick in the, well, they were supposed to be dual-purpose and had some of the characteristics criteria so the eight inch guns on the counties for example yeah they could elevate and sure they had a big shrapnel shell but the fire control and tracking and just wasn't there maybe they would be able to be used taking on early 1920s biplanes or something like that but by 1930s 1940s context no uh, so whilst they have the ability if certain issues are corrected and certain things are replaced to be dual purpose because they have this elevation capability they i would argue are not dual purpose weapons and similarly with the yamato yes it theoretically can and indeed did engage aircraft with its type 3 shells however as was proved by you know the actual engagements it fought in the shells were very good at providing a pretty light show 
and that was about it. I think, to be perfectly honest, they would have been much better just sticking the world's biggest shrapnel shells in there, but that's just me. So whilst, again, I would argue the Yamato's 18.1-inch guns had the capability to be dual-purpose weapons, I don't think they actually count as dual-purpose because they didn't meaningfully contribute to the defence of the ship. Eric24567 asks, uh, I watched the Vanguard comparison video from Battleship New Jersey's channel, and the curator mentioned that Vanguard's guns don't compare favourably to Iowa's, whilst he did acknowledge no battleship was realistically going to engage an enemy at anything further than 13 miles, few exceptions do exist, but he said the 15-inch 42s don't stack well against the 16-inch 50s as they have a shorter range and their shells are lighter than the US super heavy shells. But in that video, it doesn't look like they mentioned Vanguard can use superchargers or the 15-inch AP shells having heavier bursting charges compared to the American Super Heavies. Do these two factors even the scale, or are the 16-inch 50s that much better? You know, sometimes I think some people are just trying to start arguments between me and Battleship New Jersey Channel. It's not going to happen. Um, I've I've talked by email with, with Ryan, and we, we get on quite well, so sorry, but you're not going to have a knockdown drag-out fight between us. I know that's not the spirit of this question, but I just thought it's quite funny. Um, I'm really looking forward to being able to visit Battleship New Jersey as and when I'm able to get over to the States, so that should be a very, very interesting series of videos, I think. So there's there's two variables to this question, really, which is the, the burster charge and the supercharge. Um, that's propelling the shell now with regards to the bursting charge then yes the vanguard shells are going to be somewhat more powerful because they're carrying for the the later era shells they're carrying about 22 kilos which is almost 50 pounds of explosive now when you compare that to the mark 8 shells that the iowa is going to be using their bursting charge is about 19 and a half uh, 18 and a half kilos so about f just over 40 pounds so there's about just under 20 percent more explosive power in the shells the vanguard went once they penetrate and explode as there is on the iowa shells which basically means that when the shell reaches its point of detonation the 15 inch shell should in theory cause somewhat more damage than the 16 inch super heavy in total now obviously there is just physically a lot more metal in the 16 inch 50 mark 8 shell so the shrapnel that's generated by that explosion there's going to be more of it and it's going to be somewhat heavier from the mark 8 but there's going to be more energy to the shrapnel from the 15 inch shell and that's potentially going to give that shrapnel a further distance to go and the explosion itself is obviously going to be slightly more powerful. So overall, if you are a generic ship and you have been hit by a 15-inch shell, it's probably going to do somewhat more damage if it explodes in the same location than a Mark 8 shell would do, with the caveats just mentioned. However, that's only one half of it. The other half is the range and armor penetration, and that's where um, the superchargers come in, and that's where the 16-inch 50 and the Mark 8 shell um, do have a number of advantages. The 16-inch 50 gun is just massively more powerful. It's, well, I mean, it's a 50 caliber gun as opposed to 42 caliber gun for a start, and it's 16-inch bore as opposed to 15-inch bore. So the fact that it fires a shell with a lot more kinetic energy to start with is not exactly surprising even though it's a heavier shell. Um, so the Mark 8 shell, one of the advantages of the Super Heavy is it does retain its energy for longer distances. A lighter shell will always start losing energy faster. Um, but as mentioned, sort of 13 miles or so, about 22, 23,000 yards, much beyond that outside of exceptions like Warspite versus Julio Cesare and Sean Horse versus Glorious, yeah, there's not too many engagements where you're going to be reliably hitting much beyond that range. The super uh, superchargers on the 15-inch shell for Vanguard, as a, a rule of thumb, and bear in mind this is a rule of thumb, so not a precise figure, but it basically moves the penetration chart 
up by maybe three and a half, four thousand yards. So you could look at arm penetration table and go, okay, well, at say twenty five thousand yards or twenty thousand, let's say no, twenty thousand yards. So twenty thousand yards, the standard fifteen inch forty two gun can penetrate um, however much armor using a World War Two era shell. And then if you want to know roughly what that shell would do with a supercharge behind it, you probably want to look at what's the armor penetration at roughly 16,000, 16,500 yards. And obviously that's going to be a better performing figure. But the simple fact is that, as I say, the 16-inch 50 gun is tremendously more powerful, and so the baseline figures, even adjusted, are still, relatively speaking, in the favor of the Iowa. So when you're looking at let's say an engagement at 20,000 yards so that's probably a reasonable reasonable hitting range for a long range engagement in world war 2 bat with battleships you could expect to hit a reasonable amount of t times at that range the iowa's penetration is going to be somewhere in the region of 19 to 21 inches of armor depending on a few small variables and this is assuming everybody is nice and level and firing broadsides at each other. Obviously that's going to change if the ship's at an angle or if the ship has angled armour or if the ship is rolling slightly, those figures will vary. With supercharges at roughly the same kind of range, you could probably expect something like Vanguard's guns to maybe be achieving something in the order of about 15 inches of armour penetration. Again, give or take an inch. And of course, this doesn't account for national specifics in armor plate quality. And I know I've mentioned that in the past, but the resistive power of different nations' armor plate did vary quite considerably when it came to battleship level protection. So, and when I say considerably, I mean by sort of whole percentage points, not like 50% or something like that. But if you are looking at a British battleship, a German battleship, Japanese battleship, Italian battleship, an American battleship, if they all have exactly the same style and thickness of armour made by their respective countries, the amount that they can resist exactly the same shell being fired at them is actually going to have a reasonable amount of variance. So, But we're putting that aside for a minute. So just from those basic figures, you can see that, again, Ryan has a point, the British shells, even with the superchargers, they do not have the same level of penetration as Iowa's guns. The flip side to that is that, well, with 15 inches of armour penetration for the British guns and around about 20 inches for the American guns, there isn't any battleship outside of Yamato that can stand up to either of those guns. Maybe of the thickest parts of Vanguard or King George V's armour can stand up to Vanguard's own guns, just at that kind of range. But that's really about it, and also that's, as we said, a slightly artificial situation, assuming that everyone's going perfectly broadside to each other. Now, where those uh, penetration figures are going to make a difference is when you're going up against either something stupidly heavily armoured, like Yamato, um, at which point, as say, Vanguard's guns would need to get closer to penetrate, Iowa's wouldn't, but... In perhaps more realistic scenarios, if you're going up against a gen generic battleship, let's say we're using Richelieu as an example for both guns. Now, Richelieu's belt armour is, give or take, about 13 inches. If it's broadside on, both guns can penetrate, and then Vanguard's guns will probably do slightly more damage. But if Richelieu, say, turns and it's now 45 degrees on, Vanguard's guns might struggle to penetrate, whereas Iowa's guns are still probably going to go through, at which point, even though it's got smaller bursting charge, Iowa's shells are in the target and exploding and therefore actually doing damage, whereas Vanguard's guns are exploding on or in the armor belt and doing some damage, but not anywhere as close as what Iowa's guns would be doing. So, effectively, the superchargers bring Vanguard's guns up to a competitive level with the average decent World War II era naval gun, which is a fair old feat, uh, don't get me wrong, but the 16-inch 50 is a fantastically powerful and one of the top-end naval guns of World War II. So, in 
terms of just sheer brute punching through armor strength, the 16-inch 50 is going to win in almost all circumstances. But you still don't want to fight either of them because they're both very capable weapons. Now, the, the reason why I think this question comes up generally is because a lot of the time people look at the Iowa's the last US battleships and Vanguard the last British battleship and the inevitable question, Vanguard versus Iowa. And in that specific fight, the differences between the guns are slightly less because we used a generic Richelieu example there. For, but in that very, very, very specific matchup, you have a circumstance where the Iowa's actually have a relatively thin armor belt for a World War II battleship. It makes up for that somewhat by sloping the armor, but ultimately it is only 12 inches thick, whereas the Vanguard draws on the design lineage of the King George V and is actually one of the more heavily armored battleships of World War II. Factoring in on top of that is the fact that the, the Class A armor that the US battleships use for their, their belt armor does have a few design flaws that mean it's not quite as optimal as it could be against battleship shells, and that's something I discussed in the naval armor video, whereas British armor was one of the best armors uh, for resisting battleship shells. So combine that with the thickness of both sides, and then obviously adjusting upwards slightly for the eye with having an angled belt, whereas Vanguard doesn't, it's that difference in protection systems that makes that fight slightly more even than you might otherwise think just based on all the stuff we've discussed about the guns themselves because yes vanguard's guns are not as powerful as iowa's but they don't have quite as tough of a target to punch through as iowa's guns do punching through vanguard now realistically speaking if they're actually going at it a hammer and tongs in a world war ii context the ranges are probably going to be close enough that either side can effectively punch through the other's belt armor, albeit that that might change if they're doing a kind of post-war engagement where they're both using highly advanced radar fire control systems, but that's a completely different scenario I haven't really looked at in extreme detail. But you've got to bear in mind two things. That is bringing in the armor of the ships, specifically those two ships, not just the guns so it's an overall balance thing um and also <laughs> the other thing you've got to remember with that kind of scenario is that historically when you look at all the various battleship engagements of mostly world war ii and in a lot of cases world war one discounting things like magazine explosions quite often the hits that actually are win the battle if you like are not hits through the belt armor they are hits that disable the command and control crew, i.e. the people on the bridge, the admirals, the captains, the fire control systems, and things like this. And those systems are not protected the way that the ship's vitals are. And at that point, whether a 16-inch 50 or a 15-inch 42 shell hits your fire control system, or your rangefinders, or your radar, or your bridge etc they're gonna do an equally good job of killing those things because it's just massive overkill either way at which point it comes down to your fire control systems and who's going to hit who's going to hit first who's going to hit hard well not even hardest but who's going to hit fastest and that was actually probably going to be the deciding factor because as say the battle with with bismarck showed you can have really powerful guns, you can have a really excellent fire control system, but if the other guy wipes out your primary fire control system and then demolishes your other systems in fairly short order, you can't meaningfully resist and people can just sidle up to you and t to a range that your armor means nothing and just blast away until you eventually succumb to the inevitable. So that's, for a dry dock, a very long way of saying <laughs> the 16-inch 50s are physically the more powerful gun. They they just are. But that fact tends to get occluded somewhat when people are looking at very specific matchups, and the, the Vanguard Iowa matchup is one of those that has some very specific circumstances that tend to narrow that performance gap somewhat. Craig Hagenbruch asks 
I've noticed that when it comes to a number of British ships' funnels from the side view, they go thin, thick, and thin. Why is this? Was it rife in ship design, or was there some purpose in having different thicknesses when it came to the funnels? You do see it in most navies to different degrees. What it effectively comes down to is the boilers and the trunking, and the trunking is basically how you connect the boilers to the funnels. Every boiler isn't going to have its own separate funnel. They're joined in various numbers to a single funnel. So when it comes to whether you have a thin funnel or a thick funnel, that's largely dictated by how many boilers are connected to that particular funnel. Now, if you have relatively few boilers and you really need the upper deck space, you can trunk them all together into one massive funnel. And you see that on some ships, either low speed ships or ships that perhaps had multiple funnels when they were designed and then they were refitted with new machinery. Whereas on other ships, especially on older ships where they need a lot of power, they need a lot of boilers and the boilers themselves individually aren't that efficient or that powerful and it's all spread out, you end up with lots and lots of funnels. Now that's why the Lexington class, for example, in its initial battle cruiser form had ridiculous numbers of funnels and a lot of pre-World War Two, as pre-World War One, I should say, cruisers had three or four funnels and very occasionally more. So looking at, say, the county class, what you can tell from that is that there will be a smaller number of boilers connected to the fore and aft funnels and a much larger number of boilers connected to the amidships funnel. And because that trunking takes up space above the boilers but below the funnels, i.e. in the upper portion of the ship's hull, it basically comes down to how much space, how much do you need the space in the ship's hull volume versus how much do you need the space on the ship's upper decks. If you really, really need the deck space far more than you need the internal volume space, then you will trunk funnels together a lot more and you'll end up with a few lot much larger ones whereas if there's either a, a massive number of boilers or you need the internal volume more than you need the deck space then you can afford to have more funnels and less trunking. Dejan Gabrovsek asks how many aircraft could the King George V carry? I've read four but where were they stored? So they stored the aircraft in the amidships hangar, which you can see here had two entrances. And as you can see from the uh, tail end of the little walrus being tucked away in there, there was actually space in there, in theory at least, for four aircraft. Now, just because a ship can carry that many aircraft doesn't necessarily mean it always did. Um, protected stowage for aircraft was very important for the Royal Navy. But when you look at wartime records, whilst... Again, in theory, you could carry four aircraft. Quite often, you actually find the King George V carrying two walrus aircraft, which gives you more space inside the hangar to work on and is just generally much easier because you only have to maintain two. There is obviously the risk of that if you lose one aircraft, you've lost 50% of your force, but you would probably be able to keep the two aircraft running a lot more easily in a hangar designed for a tight squeeze of four than you would be trying to maintain four in a very very cramped working environment so when you look at say duke of york or later on when king george v takes on a couple of walrus that are equipped with radar allowing them to do radar searches it's very often you see mention two aircraft even though they can have four by definition lexington 476 asks during the Age of Sail, did the Crown or the Royal Navy have managers of the forest? To a certain degree, yes. There were royal forests, um, although most of the people employed to manage those forests originated back from the medieval period when they were managing it more to preserve the game in the forest for the king and people he chose to grant permission to, to hunt rather than to anything particular for forestry. But as time went on and as various crises evolved where people realised they were running out of timber, there was more and more woodland management by the officers of the Crown and the Royal Navy. So this tree in the uh, New Forest has this arrow symbol on it, the broad arrow. That was an admiralty symbol that basically meant if you see a tree with this symbol on it, you cannot lawfully cut it down. And if you do, they'll come after you before 
uh, effectively treason because the Admiralty is saying this is part of our national interest. This is a tree that we have earmarked for a warship. So by taking it away, you're basically stealing from the Navy, which, yeah, it's, they called it a lot of different things, but effectively they were treating it as if it, as sabotage of the military, which, yeah, you might think has some fairly strong penalties attached to it. Specif they weren't managing the entire forest because the thing is not every tree in the forest is suitable for warship production, but there would be certain forests like the New Forest, for example, which would be planted and then admiralty officers would go through and say, right, this tree will make a good tree for the Navy, mark it. This tree, we don't care, leave it, whatever. People can do whatever they like with it, and so on and so forth. Armando Matos asks, HMS Devastation seems to be often overlooked in favour of HMS Warrior and HMS Dreadnought when talking about revolutionary ships. How important was she, and how fast was she outclassed compared to the other two? So, Devastation was very revolutionary, in as much as she was the first ocean-going capital ship without sails, and a lot of people point out that, yeah, she looks kind of like a slightly more waterlogged pre-dreadnought, and indeed, yes, she does point towards that kind of design lineage, albeit without the secondary batteries. So she is very revolutionary in a number of ways. However, she tends to get overlooked because although she marks a number of big changes, they are not adopted and carried forward in quite the same way that Warrior and Dreadnought um, have their changes carried forward. So after Warrior, every line of battle ship, every capital ship that the Royal Navy and indeed most other navies built were ironclads. I mean, technically Gloire after Gloire, you could say that as well, but you know what I'm talking about. And with Dreadnought, once Dreadnought was launched, everyone started building Dreadnought-style battleships. Whereas with Devastation, although Mastless Turret Ship was the way of the future, it wasn't something that caught on immediately. The fore and aft layout didn't catch on immediately. People went to all sorts of other lengths, like um, the Italian uh, Caio Duilio Ironclads, the Italia class Ironclads, the Inflexible, which was a response to it, and so on and so forth, or with these offset central mounted wing uh, turrets. You had a lot of ships that were still built as either central battery ships or turret ships with turrets and midships with sails and masts and rigging and all of that. HMS Alexandra is a good example. So she, her innovation didn't quite stick as much. As you remember, she's designed and built in the early 1870s, but her form doesn't really re-engage with mainstream battleship design really much until the 18 late 1880s early 1890s there are a few more mastless ships with um, guns fore and aft in towards the very end of the 1870s and the early 1880s but at that point the open barbette craze is sweeping everybody so the, the turret isn't so much there you look at something like hms benbow for example and then when you start to see the return of the mastless turret ship you end up with things like sans Parai and victoria which have a big turret up front even though some some of the original designs did call for a kind of a devastation style layout and it's only really when you start to see things like um, the royal sovereign class and contemporary vessels um, of that kind of design you start to see devastations layout generally coming back and then you get majestic the majestic class and the other early pre-dreadnoughts so Whilst revolutionary, she she doesn't have her ideas immediately take over naval design the same way that Warrior and Dreadnought did. As far as how far she was outclassed compared to the other vessels, well, this all depends on this massive debate about how actually combat effective these sort of late 18th century ships with a few very big guns and not much else would actually have been at all, period. But in terms of her modernity, her ability to stand generally in the battle line as far as everybody understood it, she was actually probably outclassed slightly slower than the others. Now, all three would have been viable combatants for quite a while because there would have been other ships of roughly the same power, or slightly more where they still have a fighting chance. 
it's not just going to be the ships that completely outclass them. But when you look at Warrior, obviously 1860, by the late 1860s, sort of 1867, 1868, when you've got ships like Monarch and Minotaur coming in, they're far more heavily armed, they're far more heavily armoured. So Warrior is outclassed in terms of the newest and best ships in probably six, seven years. Whereas Dreadnought is pretty much actually slightly quicker because Dreadnought's 1906. The 13.5 inch Super Dreadnoughts are 1910, 1911. The um, 15 inch Super Dreadnoughts like Queen Elizabeth are 1913. So at that point, yeah, it's four to six years for her to be outclassed. Whereas, but and by the outclass, I mean definitively outclassed. Obviously, very quickly you've got ships with ten or twelve gun broadsides in a matter of two or three years when it comes to dreadnought. But in terms of firepower and armor protection, dreadnought could still give them a fight. Whereas, I don't think you're going to find many people that could argue that dreadnought could give anything like a fair fight to a Iron Duke or a Queen Elizabeth. Now with devastation because of this sort of meandering between do we have central battery ships with mass do we have turret ships with mass where do we put the turrets do we go for the once every quarter hour firing of something like inflexible or italia it took a little bit longer for devastation to be outclassed i think of those three ships she was probably still a frontline combatant well into the 1880s and then things start to overtake her through technological advancement and such so yeah uh weirdly enough takes slightly longer to be outclassed even though she doesn't have quite the same effect on ship design and perhaps because of that to be honest james bigger asks you've mentioned the north carolina class battleships had a vibration problem that forced them to operate at reduced speed until the problem was diagnosed and corrected Exactly what was the problem, what caused that vibration, and how was it corrected? How long did it take them to fix it? The problem fundamentally was resonance. There's always a little bit of vibration associated with propellers going round and round at high speeds, but it just so happened that the combination of the particular propellers that the North Carolinas were launched with, plus the new and rather unusual ship structure design, the hull structure, which they'd employed to comply with the treaty requirements and to comply with a bunch of other restrictions and requirements for US battleships, such as having to fit through the Panama Canal, meant that when they were running up to their top speed, the resonance of the hull and the resonance of the propellers began to sink, which then led to massive vibration. That was quite a quite a bit of panic in the US Navy when that happened, because the whole structure method that they were using had been incorporated into a lot of different ships at the time, including the design for the South Dakota class and broadly the design for the Iowa class by the time the, uh, the the problem actually showed up on the North Carolinas. So it looked for a little while as if all US modern battleships would be unable to hit their full speed and thus operate with the carriers, which would have been very embarrassing and quite, quite bad. Um, the USS Atlanta as well, although the hull form is completely different from the North Carolina, used a similar hull structure and had similar vibration problems. And this is longitudinal vibration as opposed to transverse vibration. Now, the main way they tried to solve it was to change the propellers, so um, mainly by increasing the number of blades. So initially, the propeller blades on the North Carolinas were um, four blade and three blade, depending on if you're looking on the outboard or inboard propellers and eventually it was four blade and five blade and obviously that meant each blade of the propeller was individually slightly smaller or considerably smaller in the case of the five blade in terms of overall surface area and that changed the resonant frequency of the propellers and the idea was hopefully to desync it with the resonant frequency of the hull they also ended up although they didn't necessarily want to but they ended up having to brace and clamp down the propeller shafts the turbines and if you look at some pictures of the aft of the ship the aft fire control station as well to stop the vibrations because although they'd reduced it they hadn't completely solved it and as far as 
how, apart from those missions, to partially correct it, it was never actually fully solved. As I mentioned in my video on Washington, even in 1944, they were still swapping propellers around trying to figure out a way to reduce it. But from the time of their trials to the time it was mostly solved, it was kind of 43-ish, late 42, early 43, depending on the ship. Washington had almost entirely resolved its issues in 1944 with the Puget Sound refit it had then with new propellers. But, as I mentioned in the Washington video, that just served to relocate the problems to a 17 to 20 knot range um, rather than at the 26 to 28 knot range. So they, they were still there. It's just one of those things. It was completely unexpected when it occurred and it was only ever to be able to be partially fixed because fundamentally if you wanted to completely eliminate it you would have to completely redesign the hull and that's not a thing you can do once you've actually built the ship but they were able to incorporate some changes into the South Dakota and Iowa class designs that meant that that issue didn't reoccur in anywhere near the same uh, manner that it did on the North Carolinas and also, you know, whilst the hull structure had similarities, the hull structure and form was slightly different on those ships, which also mitigated against it somewhat. Econoclast asks, If one of the major problems of vertical triple expansion engines was height, why not make horizontal triple expansion engines? Well, there's a few issues with wear and tear when it comes to this kind of engine if you mount the whole thing sideways, because now you've got gravity acting on or acting perpendicular to the general line of motion as opposed to parallel with it that's something of a side issue though the problem is that as you can see vertical triple expansion engines are quite tall if you turn them sideways they're now quite wide and that means they're going to take up a lot of horizontal space, which means that your beam is going to go up quite dramatically, or you're going to have kind of whole side to whole side engines, which means no space for passageways, no space for coal bunkers, or, or, or you know, actually mostly coal bunkers for VTEs, no space for torpedo defences or anything like that. So you render the ship much, much more vulnerable to underwater damage and cut down on your overall... Um, storage space for things like fuel so it would create far more problems for the survivability of the ship than it would solve in terms of freeing up deck space for various bits of armament. Hammerbolt asks all gun destroyers did anyone try or design such ships in the 1930 to 45 period thinking of pure anti-aircraft or anti-torpedo destroyer defense? In the interwar period when we're talking about proper fleet destroyers no um, because the torpedo was still seen as a vital weapon for any destroyer and in some cases even the primary weapon for a destroyer because of its ability to hurt ships much much bigger than the destroyer so every destroyer had at least some torpedoes even the tribals which are about as close as you're going to get to gun armed destroyers of the time period are still rolling around with a quad torpedo launcher now, once you get into World War II, whilst there aren't any, again, full fleet destroyers designed to have only guns for anti-aircraft work, there are a few towards the end of World War II that either have their torpedo tubes significantly reduced or indeed entirely eliminated, leaving them as primarily, or in some cases entirely, gun-based destroyers. And you do see this trend develop a lot more after the war as well. Um, obviously that trend is developing more amongst the Allied navies because, frankly, by the end of the war the chances of running into anything big enough to be worth torpedoing uh, in a destroyer are pretty slim. But there's an awful lot of aircraft out there. And so you see, start to see torpedo tubes landed in favour of more anti-aircraft guns and or more sensors, radar and such like. So you end up do end up with some pure gun destroyers by the end of World War II, but it's not by intentional design from the outset. Matthew Jones asks, I have heard in some TV shows or films in the Age of Sail where cr gun crews are told to double load. Was this ever a thing, and if so, what were the details of it? 
Yes, this was done uh, relatively frequently, actually. The thing about sticking two cannonballs, and in some cases there were even cases of triple-shotting a cannon where you stick three cannonballs in, the guns could usually withstand that, but because you're not using any significant increase in charge in terms of the gunpowder, they are obviously not going to be quite as fast, and therefore they're not going to go quite as far. So if you're engaging in what for Nelsonian era was kind of a medium range gunfight, if you double or triple shot your guns, they're probably either not going to reach that far, or if they do, they're not going to have a tremendous amount of energy left. But if you are at, say, point blank range, or you know you're about to get into point blank range, then, well, extra destruction is always fun. And so when ships knew that they were going to get in close, you could, would quite often have an order to double or triple shot the guns. Normally, this would be two cannonballs. Sometimes it could be mixed. So sometimes you might stick one type of ammunition first and then another second, depending on what you thought you might get as a benefit out of that. And that does include... Um, as I've mentioned a few times before at the Battle of Trafalgar, where some absolute genius took a carronade and loaded the big 68-pounder shot in and then stuffed a small keg of musket balls in on top, thus creating an impromptu world's largest shotgun, which turned out to be pretty darn effective. Um, and then, yeah, light the uh, fuse and send many, many kilograms or pounds of hot iron at your enemies and hope that they don't return the favour. Alan Lundgren asks, if World War II-era battleship hulls have been kept in service and periodically modernised, how many VLS cells could be installed in place of the primary gun turrets on an Iowa or King George V class ship? And what considerations would affect this, such as displacement, sea keeping, difficulty in armouring the cells, etc.? So, just going by quick rough and ready estimates, using the barbette diameter of the Iowas, if you leave the barbette in place using the stated dimensions, a Mark 41 VLS cell, which is, well, an 8 cell a unit, then if you leave the barbette completely in place, I leave the armour in place, without getting into sort of fancy geometries and everything, you can fit a comfortable 48 cell, 48 missiles, 48 VLS cells in there, i.e. 6 8 cell packs, without much issue but you'll have plenty of space to spare so i'm sure there's probably slightly more efficient ways of sticking the cells in there however if you were well i mean obviously you've taken the turret off but if you're taking the turret off and you take the barbette out so you're more talking about just using the general floor plan space of the barbette rather than specifically the interior diameter then you can get 72 cells in there uh, quite comfortably without with only minor overlaps at the corner, sort of like a third of a cell here, a quarter of a cell here. Um, and so that's per barbette. Whiskey Delta Golf asks, During the Ironclad era, we saw an eclectic collection of failed concepts and quickly surpassed designs. Was this unique to the rapid evolution of technology during the period, or were there other points in time where this happened which we hear less about? If so, are there any his interesting abandoned designs or concepts from those eras that we still know of today. I don't think that anything's seen quite the level of eclectic design and so quickly surpassed technology that you see in the late 19th century. But back in the 3rd and 4th centuries BC, there was kind of a naval arms race dash showing off race between the various successor states to Alexander the Great which resulted, at least ostensibly, in some truly hilariously impractical vessels, um, which I think, were mostly for show rather than for actual practical service, but they were kind of constant one-upmanship. So the very fact that you had one just meant that someone else was probably going to try and build a much bigger one, and so on and so forth. And, well, I wouldn't necessarily say we have exact plans for any of them, because we don't, but we do have, well... Some idea of, of from where to start with trying to reconstruct them, even if the various ideas on reconstructions are massively different here every time. And one of the other relatively little-known periods of rather interesting naval development 
is kind of the 15th, 16th century when you start to see the introduction of guns in the Mediterranean uh, because you get a whole raft of vessels, almost literally, uh, everything from really lightly built galleys to modifications of galleons, galleasses, um, or heavily built galleys, and all sorts of other weird and wonderful ships as well. And there's a little bit of a naval design race until things stabilize a bit more towards the end of the 16th and start of the 17th centuries. But it is a very definitely an interesting time period for naval design there. Texas and La Choc asks, what is the most surprising thing you've learned while putting together these videos on the dry docks? Absolutely honestly, um, just how many people out there are actually interested in naval history and generally speaking, actually how nice and helpful so many of you guys are. Um, I mean, YouTube and YouTube comment sections have a reputation which is usually fairly well justified, but Thanks to, I mean, admittedly, thanks to um, some relatively judicious and perhaps sometimes overzealous moderating by the YouTube algorithm recently. But to be honest, more generally, I think just the general conduct of you guys listening, I think the channel and its comment section is a fairly pleasant place to be, especially compared to um, some other corners of the internet where, yeah, let's just not go there. Um, but that I think would be genuinely the most surprising thing for me as a just as a general factor. But outside of that, in terms of what you you may have actually been asking about, which is uh, sort of naval history type of stuff, I would say probably the single most surprising thing to me has been the level and complexity of some of the alternate design work that went into the various ships that, you know, we actually see coming off the production lines. Now, obviously, I've known, uh, as any decent naval historian should, that there were designs prepared, preliminary designs, options, etc., that never saw the light of day because they went with the ships that we all know and love that actually saw service. But when I've been digging into the backgrounds of various ships, both for Five Minute Guides and for Wednesday videos, and even for Dry Docks as well, I think the most surprising is just how many there were, how many design options. I mean, some some ships, uh, especially some battleships, the number of design options when they're numbered, or well, actually more specifically when they're lettered, they almost run out of letters in the alphabet before they settle on a design. So you're looking at like two dozen plus individual designs and that's just in the design series which was the one that was agreed to move forward with. That's not even counting the various sort of slightly further out there options that they looked at beforehand. So yeah, that's that's one of the things I think has, has been... A little bit of a surprise to me because you, you think in terms of especially when you're looking at perhaps some slightly more general histories of specific ships you see okay well they considered that, like these two or three or four options and then they settled on this one but quite often well that sometimes that is just literally where it comes from quite often in in many cases you are looking at a case of it's the tail end of maybe even upwards of 40 or 50 different designs, each of which are unique enough to be called their own ship. And then you realise, yeah, that's why it takes so long to design a new warship. It's not that someone sat down and said, right, we are designing a King George V. It's, this is what we've got left after we've analysed and eliminated practically every other possible way to do what we actually want to do within the limits that we've been set. Reichsbeer Minister asks, U boats at Jutland and their possible impact, as I recall from your series, they were not present from either side. Well, why was that? And what effect could they have had if they were deployed by or on both sides? Fundamentally, it comes down to speed. The average cruising speed of a battle fleet was, for World War I, depending on the submarine type, either 
at or even above the flat out surface speed of a sub. So they just simply couldn't keep up. This is one of the reasons why the K class were developed and a number of other classes in toward the end of World War One and thereafter in an effort to make a sub that could hope to keep up with the battle fleet on the surface. And then you've got the problem of once you're dived in a sub of World War One, your speed drops massively to the point that you near as much as makes no difference when compared to the speed and the maneuvers that a battle fleet is going to be pulling off are pretty much effectively stationary and hoping that the enemy is going to come to you. And then you have to basically guess very, very right and hope that they do run pretty much over your position and hope that their anti-submarine efforts aren't particularly brilliant and hope that they don't pull an evasive action at the last minute either, just randomly, just in case you're there, or randomly because of incoming enemy fire, or any other number of reasons. And the battle moves on pretty quickly, so even if, you know, if, if you're there, if you're in a perfect position, you and let's say you miss, because that's entirely possible, well, even if everybody misses you surfacing and doesn't shoot you to pieces, which they probably will, but even if that didn't happen, the at that point when everyone's charging around at full speed, you're never going to get another chance to catch back up, set up, and try again. Um, so, again, this is why the various fleet submarine programs were initiated to try and address this very fundamental issue. And then as far as, you know, submarines operating off the coast, off the enemy's ports to catch them as they come out, both sides tried at various points, but, you know, if the enemy's entrances to mined channels and to harbours are known or well, they're known to both sides at that point and so the enemy is going to make sure they have plenty of anti-submarine patrols in the area which is going to make life as a submarine very difficult especially because the submarine can't just turn up randomly it's got to be there on patrol for a fairly long time to catch uh, an enemy fleet coming out so that increases the chances of it being detected and destroyed or driven off and in Jutland's case in particular the actual deployment was supposed to be earlier, but for various reasons um, was delayed. And that meant that the U-boats that were deployed to try and catch the Grand Fleet had either been blown off course or were running low on fuel. And so there weren't as many of them there and they were a bit scattered. But even then, it kind of illustrates the point because there were a couple of U-boats that did sight elements of the Grand Fleet leaving harbour. But even when they saw them, there was nothing they could do because they were just that fraction not in the direction that the ships were going. Or in one case, the ships were bearing down on the sub and then they did a, the le a leg of a zigzag and took it out of the range of the sub before they'd even gotten just about gotten into range. And again, the sub underwater speed too slow to actually do anything about that and definitely couldn't surface with all those destroyers and cruisers around, and so they just fundamentally were not capable of interdicting enemy battle fleets. Captain Landlocked asks, Can an economically weaker country actually win a naval war? It would seem that a weaker economy cannot win a full-on naval war against a stronger economy. It seems the only way to oppose a stronger naval power is first grind down their own economy, which is playing into the really long con and becomes less and less viable as time advances. Would you agree, or is this missing something? So there's kind of two elements to this. One is, are there other distractions for that stronger economy? Because, yes, theoretically the answer is yes, an economically weaker country can win a naval war. But the first thing is, can you distract the stronger economy with something else? Because, let's say let's say using arbitrary currencies, let's say your national economy is worth, uh, let's use figures for, I don't know, the 17th or 18th century, it's worth 10 million arbitrary currency units. And the enemy's economy is worth 20 million arbitrary currency units. So they've got twice the economic power. Assuming everything else is the same, and that is something that we'll come to in a minute, but assuming all other factors are the same, the enemy can outbuild you two to one, 
you will lose. Unless a few things happen. You, your enemy might have other priorities um, in military terms. So if you are, say, an island nation, like Britain, and your opponent is a continental nation like France, then whilst that eco enemy economy might be larger, they also have to maintain and support a fairly large land army. And for them, the most pressing existential threat to their nation is going to be a land invasion across their borders. So then let's say that they're, let's say uh, you're, you, they're using a budget that is 10% of their national economy. And it's a little bit high for defense for most of the time, but let's just arbitrarily say so. So they have a budget of 2 million. If their main priority is their army, then they might spend 75% of that budget on the army. So they spend 1.5 million on the army, and then that leaves them half a million to spend on the navy. You, on the other hand, as an island nation, your primary existential threat is from a seaborne invasion. So you're going to concentrate vastly more of your resources into you know, building a navy rather than building an army. So you might spend 90% of your budget on your navy and only 10% on your army. So in a direct clash of armies, you're hopelessly outnumbered and outmatched, but they've got to get past your navy to get to you. At which point, if you spent 90% of your 1 million budget, you've now spent 900,000 on your navy, the enemy has spent 500,000 on their navy, so you actually have an almost 2 to 1 advantage in your navy, despite the fact that the power you're going up against is economically far, far stronger than you. And that might allow you to win a naval war, especially if you can get your hits in quickly and destroy the enemy navy, or destroy, capture, or cripple a large amount of it. Because then, assuming that you know, they've still got this existential threat of land-based invasion, they could try and rebuild. And if they use roughly the same amount of money, you, you're still going to have a bigger navy. If they turn around and open up the, the floodgates of funding, if you've got that much of a lead, you might be able to keep on destroying their fleet in isolation. But that does rely on them making certain mistakes. And to a certain extent, you see this with the Napoleonic Wars. Britain has a very powerful economy and arguably one that is stronger than France on its own. But once France has taken over most of Europe, Britain is not economically stronger than most of Europe put together. And you see this in as much as you have the Battle of Trafalgar and everyone thinks that's kind of the end of the war at sea. It's not. It's the end of the immediate threat of invasion to mainland UK, but the Royal Navy has to then keep up a near enough 10-year constant blockade against most of the European coast in order to stop the French from rebuilding their navy, and the French keep building new ships because they have the economy and they have the industry to do it. Now, fair enough, a bunch of those ships either end up burnt or in Royal Navy service, which is very nice of them, but the Royal Navy has to maintain this massive blockade fleet to stop the French building this new fleet and coalescing it into another, you know, large unit that would threaten Britain's existence again. So that's one way of doing it. Another way of doing it would be to potentially identify some new game-changing uh, weapon or technology and embrace it as quickly and quietly as possible, get it spread throughout your entire fleet. We're assuming now that, you know, we we don't have the distraction of a land-based existential threat to the bigger economy, so it's they've got the bigger fleet than you. But if you can capitalise and develop this sort of game-changing weapon or technology as quickly as possible, you might then have an opportunity where, despite the fact your fleet is outnumbered, the level of force on each side is actually in your favour, and then you hit them as hard and quickly as possible to knock their fleet down to well below your size, and then try and keep on top of them from there. But that relies on, one, you being the aggressor, which, if it doesn't work, is going to be very bad for you because, you know, they're going to have the bigger... the enemy's going to have the bigger forces. And two, it relies on either your enemy not adopting that technology particularly quickly or not developing some kind of counter to it pretty quickly, both of which are, shall we say, somewhat long odds, considering that bigger economies usually have, you know, the resources to do that, even if inefficiently. The last thing 
where I would say an economically weaker country can win a naval war against a bigger one is dependent on the efficiency of that economy. So if, you, let's say, again, using our 10 million and 20 million um, GDPs for both countries, if the country with a 10 million GDP is able to, through bureaucracy and, you know, government oversight and all these other things, is able to raise funds equivalent to, say, 20% of their GDP, again, using completely arbitrary figures, as taxes and revenue to the government, then they have a budget of 2 million to play with. If the country opposite them with its theoretical GDP of uh, 20 million is so hilariously either corrupt or inept or just hasn't developed the next stage of bureaucracy could even be things like develop the development of centralized banking um, or national debt or something like that but if they don't have these systems in place then whilst they might have a notional economy that's worth 20 million the government might only be able to raise revenue to the tune of, say, 5% of their GDP, at which point they're only raising 1 million in revenue. You're raising two from a smaller economy, which means you actually now, despite having the smaller economy, have the budgetary advantage, which means, of course, you can build a more powerful navy and you can win. The one downside to that is the arbitrary scales of efficiency aside, um, as a war goes on, if you maintain that level of taxation, you will obviously be draining your economy far faster, which means as a smaller economy, you might start actually, you know, crippling your own country's economy and then running it down at a point where your theoretically outmatched, outnumbered enemy might still just be chugging along at that same level constantly and constantly and constantly and not affecting the overall output of their country's economy anywhere near as much as you are. So... You know, swings and roundabouts, but you could do it in that case. Again, assuming your enemy doesn't wise up and, and re refine how they're generating revenue. And that brings us to the end for this week, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for listening. Um, only two quick bits of channel admin for this week. So now that we have one, two, three weeks left to go. Uh, just thought I'd throw in a quick reminder for those of you who are based in the UK, or probably more specifically the southern UK, to be honest, uh, that I will be at the Chalk Valley Living History Festival um, in my 14th century medieval guise on the 26th and 27th of June. So um, if you happen to be in the area and you happen to like history, it's a big multi-period event. So come and say hi. I may well be in the guise of a medieval archer, but I'm not averse to talking to you about naval history as well if you want. Um, extra prize, obviously, if you can spot who I am in <laughs> in my uh, medieval reenactment gear. So there's that. And the only other thing is I'm happy to announce that um, along with the 250k subscriber competition, which hopefully should be going live uh, in the forthcoming week, there are also a ton of new posters available. Well, will be available. They'll be launched at the same time. But I'm really happy with the way they've come out. And um, I've also worked out a slightly better way of shipping them over to the States. Yeah, for those of you who are in the States, with the help of uh, some of yourselves overseas, actually. So that's all going to be very good. So watch this space at some point over the next coming week and see how things go. All right. Thank you very much for listening and hope to see you again in another video.